Hello everyone. Welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Jitendra. This is a conversation with Arvid Ogren. He is an evolutionary biologist at Uppsala University and the author of a fantastic book, The Genes I View of Evolution. In this conversation, we talk about what is a gene, past and present of genes I view of evolution, selfish genetic elements, population genetics, and what genes I view of evolution lacks. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um, hi, Arvid. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. So uh, let's start with your interest in evolutionary biology, how it started and when it started. So it's a good question. In a way, it started early in the sense that I've quite long known that I wanted to do evolutionary biology. So kind of when I was leaving high school, going into university, I was pretty set on doing evolutionary uh, biology. Uh, at the same time, as I describe in the book, I came to the field in a somewhat unusual way in that I've always been, never really been that good of a natural historian. You know, I'm not very like good at identifying birds or, or plants. Um, I'm not particularly good in the lab, uh, like I'm a pre pretty mediocre uh, bench scientist. Um, so instead kind of what, what attracted me to, to biology, particularly evolutionary biology, was a kind of fascination more with kind of the, uh, the philosophical issues of the field and kind of the logic of, of natural um, selection. And that kind of really uh, got emphasized when I was a, uh, a, an undergraduate student and kind of first kind of really introduced into to evolutionary theory and the, the many debates that, uh, that surround it. And that's kind of when I really, really got hooked uh, on it. Yeah, as a scientist who has uh, his own research group and who has written a book, I think that's a quite humble, um, opinion about <laughs> about the way you started um tell me tell me more about like your favorite scientists or your scientific heroes that that you've always admired um in your career and so, so so for me like for so many others i think particularly who, who grew up in in europe the i was introduced really to through, through richard dawkins and his writing i think left a very deep mark on me and that was kind of like the, the introduction to it uh as i kind of started reading more of the primary literature, I've always admired um, Donald Maynard Smith, the, uh, the English uh, theoretical um, biologist. Um, he was kind of active in the second half of the, of the 20th century. Uh, uh, he, he worked on sort of wide range of, of topics from kind of from molecular evolution to, to social evolution. He did um, theory, he could analyze data. Uh, and also the, when you read about uh, how he was, he always kind of is described as his very like kind person he always had time for for graduate students and to talk to more younger and junior colleagues um, and so kind of the way he did science the way he wrote about science and the way he seemed to have been as, as a scientist it's something that I've always admired and I always think that like it's, I kind of wish I was born you know only is 20 years earlier you know so you would have had the experience to to meet him um, but he's certainly kind of one person who's, who's writing writing that keep coming back uh, to and uh, I really think that I hope someone one day will write a good biography uh, of John Maynard Smith. Uh, I think from like kind of given how, how big of a name he was in uh, evolutionary biology and kind of he still has, no one has written a kind of a full length biography. And I think that would be a really fun, uh, fun thing to read. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And so now you uh, run a research group at Uppsala University. Um, what are the major questions that you are working on? And, um, and also you are involved in teaching, right? So what's, what's that experience uh, like? Yeah, so I just started uh, at Uppsala. This is kind of my current position uh, in the, in, in the uh, early fall last year. So it's primarily a, a or it technically is a 100% research position, but because I like teaching, I do a little bit uh, of that as well. The kind of research questions that... Uh, motivate what we do is that I've always been interested in genetic conflicts and the biology of so-called selfish genetic elements. So genes that have the ability to promote their own transmission, even if it comes at the expense of other genes in the genome, and actually often at the expense of the fitness of the individual organism that carries it. So it's been, always been this kind of fun evolutionary conundrum of how can genes that are kind of bad for the individual organism ever spread uh, in the population. So I'm kind of fascinated by 
those kinds of questions. And in general, the research kind of proceeds at two main, two main avenues. So first, we're interested in how and why genetic conflicts arise and kind of what prevents them from getting out of hand. So to get at this question, we, we primarily develop um, theory, population genetic theory, so kind of model different scenarios when genes may come into conflict and how those conflicts may be resolved. Uh, second of all, I'm kind of interested in what, what can studying genetic conflicts tell us about social evolution more generally? So the field of social, social evolution you know, is, is a really quite an old one, but it's one that has primarily focused on whole organisms, or organisms cooperating with each other or coming into conflict with each other. And with it, is, it has been this really rich uh, theoretical framework. So we're interested in kind of, can you take these models that were developed with whole organisms in mind and apply them to, to the genome and kind of ask the same kind of questions at the molecular level. But then also kind of making the reciprocal link of what can the kind of, what we learn from kind of how genetic conflicts play out about the kind of empirical details, how that is manifested. How do they feed back into our theoretical model, kind of updating that uh, theoretical framework to develop one that kind of can encounter, that can kind of deal with conflict cooperation at all levels uh, of life. Um, and it, in many ways, this is kind of like this, this second interest in kind of the general principles of social evolution that, that led me to, to write uh, this book as well, because I've been interested in the kind of the history and philosophy of these issues. Um, and, in, and in many ways, that's kind of the, the teaching I've done has kind of been in that vein too. So the, this, the last a um, few weeks, we, we just wrapped it up, but we have been teaching a, a graduate seminar on, on the origins of theoretical population genetics, um, which is kind of always been interested in, in the history of it. And I think genetics is a really fun field. It has a very rich history, exciting to learn, you know, the, the science of it, but also big personalities. And I think it's, it's an important, I think as a genetics, it's an important history to know because of its associations with uh, kind of the darker sides of our, of our field as well. So it's, it's a kind of fascinating uh, topic to teach, I think. Yeah, that, that's definitely interesting. Um, but before we dive into the contents uh, of your book, um, let's let's uh, get this bit of introduction to to how things started, uh, especially the theory of evolution um, and genetics, of course. So uh, le let's talk about a um, little bit about Darwin and Wallace's work on evolution, and then of course uh, how um, there was another scientist which. Uh, which basically was working in the city where I am right now in Brno, um, uh, Mendel, mm -hmm. um, and how these two, uh, the, the most fascinating ideas in biology uh, so far, they were evolving side by side. Like, yeah, so this was a really exciting time in in many ways. About, about a hundred, little over one hundred and fifty years uh, ago, which is a kind of in parallel. There were a lot of things going on, both the the work that. Darwin was doing in, 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 in England where kind of evolution, as I say, was in the air, that people had these ideas about that life had been modified uh, over time. And what Darwin then provided, and as, as kind of Wallace did independently of him, was to provide a, a suggest a mechanism for how evolution might happen. And this mechanism then was uh, natural uh, selection. Um, this idea that uh, all organisms are, are, um, in, are related, and descend from, from, from common ancestors. And then they've been shaped by these evolutionary processes and then primarily then the forces of natural selection. Um, and it's interesting, you, you bring up Mendel, it's, it's, a good, um, it's a good thing because when you read the origin, you're often very, the origin of species, you're very struck by just how many aspects of the theory that Darwin had considered. It really is it's kind of one long argument where he kind of systematically goes through both the kind of the theoretical argument but also drawing upon all these kind of sources of, of data to bolster up uh, his, uh, his uh, theory. Uh, and then he you know, develops that in, in subsequent books. But what is missing throughout all of them is this uh, functioning theory of heredity. He doesn't understand how heredity is supposed to work. And he, he has these ideas of that he, he speculates and he tries to come up with it. And, but he, you can kind of tell that he, he is struggling with it and he is vulnerable to the criticism that he has this great theory, but he has an under, no real understanding of how that is supposed to work. Uh, and I guess the, the great historical irony in that is that in parallel, not by kind of modern standards, not very particular, not that far away, is this other person working, Gregor Mendel, on the, exactly this um, 
question. And we now know, uh, came up upon the, the solution that uh, inheritance works in this inheritance this discrete uh, par particles that we now refer to as, um, as genes. Um, and had he known that, I mean, you, the, the theory of our field would have looked very different because what came in kind of in that, that the, the decades after Darwin and Mendel passed away, it was a time where as kind of Mendel's ideas were, were sometimes not re referred to as rediscovered at the turn of the century, because they were kind of published in, not in English, and they're kind of not really read by the kind of movers or shakers of, of British science until around 1900. Uh, and this led to then this kind of disagreements of whether these kind of uh, Mendelian ideas of inheritance were compatible with the gradualism of evolution by natural selection. And that kind of the split that now sometimes referred to the split between on one and biometricians who studied kind of this gradualism of, of evolution with the Mendelians who were very focused on kind of large kind of discrete changes. And not to jump ahead too far, but kind of it wasn't then until like in the 1920s and the emergence of population genetics and then eventually kind of what's not known as the modern synthesis of evolution, where it was shown that indeed these two things can be uh, synthesized, re reconciled into one theory where inheritance is by uh, Mendelian genetics and the kind of the mechanism of, of changes evolution by, by natural uh, selection. Yes, I mean, indeed the modern synthesis uh, look quite different already. Uh, I mean, but, but of course it took um, another 150 years to reach at that point. Um, but yes, we, we are there. And um, so the, this idea of, um, of the genes I view of evolution, that's basically come, um, it, it, it kind of brings both of them together, right? So yes, I did, did... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna, so did, I mean, the genes have you, kind of depending a little bit how you read it, the, the history is either kind of you can think of it as kind of like the culmination of the, the, the modern synthesis is very much kind of like it emerges you know, right after the modern synthesis. If the modern synthesis kind of, you know, Julian Huck's book comes in, in, in 1942 and the kind of the, the genes have you is in the, in the mid 60s as we kind of, so it's kind of just like the, the kind of generation after the, um, the modern synthesis architect that where this is articulated, but it, it, it owes a lot to the, the modern synthesis and kind of its proponents have often emphasized that they view it as just kind of providing a more distilled and more lucid, more succinct version of the modern synthesis uh, uh, argument as it, as, it, as it was first articulated. And, but then how did you reach uh, at the at the idea of writing a book on the uh, on the genes I, I view of evolution? Um, so I, I, I've been wanting to write it for quite a long time because uh, I, I, I've been taken by this way of thinking. I think ever since I read uh, The Extended Phenotype, which is Richard Dawkins' second book, and it's also a book that uh, it's rather unu unusual compared to his other, uh, other ones. It's the only one that is written for a academic audience is written for other biologists. Uh, so it's kind of, it's fully referenced in, in, in a way that we are used to reading from, from papers or uh, academic monographs. Um, but it's also, it's a book that like, where he first clearly lays out this way of thinking, but it also kind of replies to a lot of the, the critics that had kind of uh, attacked the, the selfish gene and, and those ideas. And it's kind of like, to me, it's just like, wow, this is a really fascinating way of thinking about it. But it also seems so fun with these kind of theoretical debates in, in biology. And I very much felt like, you know, whatever that is that is going on here, like I want to do that. Like th that's what I want to do. Um, and it's kind of carried with me. This is, I read this when I was an undergrad. It carried with me throughout, throughout grad school. And then I was busy doing kind of, kind of traditional empirical work and kind of learning the, the, the craft. Uh, but I've been wanting to write something about it for a long time time and then it was when I received I received this, this fellowship that I'm still on uh, a couple of years ago and it took me to, first took me to to Harvard and then I knew I would have a couple of years now where I didn't have to apply for, for grants as much I'd spend a lot of time the first time after my PhD you know writing grants and trying to you know come to you know, fund the funding to do work all the time and now I knew I would have some time and I really felt like you know what if I could do kind of what what, what can I do now that I really uh, you know I had some research ideas that I, that I, that I should do, but also like now I'm in this really exciting environment, a lot of people tackling big questions. So that's what I choose, go for it. Um, and, and, and in a way, I was just kind of just doing it. So it, 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 I started thinking about more seriously about doing this 
think it's in the fall of 2018, I thought I should really try to do it. So then it was this process of, you know, coming up with a proposal, refining that, getting in touch with, uh, you know, being introduced to a publisher and the review process and all of that. But it was kind of like, I had thought about this debate for quite a while because I thought it was this really fun combination of science and philosophy and just kind of sociology of science almost like these kind of personalities and, and, and kind of what and I was fascinated about both kind of this way of thinking but also why do, why do we keep disagreeing about it why is it that our field is so divided over over this that to some this is like the way the light in the way to approach evolution and to, and to some it's just like a, a, a dated way of uh, doing biology that's you know so as best before dates expire in the 1980s uh, so, like to, to me, there was something interesting there in those kind of disparate uh, views uh, of it. So, I really wanted to write a book about that, and I wanted to to have kind of one uh, kind of cohesive introduction to it because that was another thing, and there wasn't really somewhere you could go to get a one kind of one stop overview of the debate. There's a lot of greater things written about it, but it kind of spread out across papers and chapters in different books and so on. And I really wanted to have one one place where it, where it was all kind of um, collected. Yeah, interesting. The, so, the, so the point here is, or one of the confusions which are there is the, uh, I think it's a lot over the semantics or over the language itself. Uh, to start with gene, how do you define gene? So what's the gene in the genes eye view of evolution and the, there is another gene which, uh, in general, defined from uh, like at the molecular terms, right? Yeah, and, and so this is exactly right. It kind of starts at the very um, beginning, kind of. So some of the, the kind of confusion, and to kind of see what how the gene side view defines the gene or the gene of the gene side view, it, it it can help to just take a step back to think about kind of how it emerged. We touch upon that it kind of comes right after the the modern synthesis. So the genes have in many ways takes a starting point in population genetics, this idea that you can describe evolution as changes in allele uh, frequencies, that this kind of provides a, a formal way to, to study evolution. But it combines that with kind of a way of talking or thinking about evolution that comes more from the study of animal behavior, both George Williams and Richard Dawkins, Bill Hamilton and other kind of early adopters of this way of thinking were fascinated by, by animal behavior. And they're there's been a tr tradition more of talking in terms of what's sometimes known as agential thinking and thinking in terms of animals or, or other as being agents that are trying to, to do things. So the genes that we kind of combine these two traditions, so it takes kind of the, the, uh, the ideas of population genetics that evolution is like changes in elite frequencies and brought with it is kind of agential thinking from the study of, of social evolution or animal behavior that you kind of think of. Uh, genes as if there were agents trying to make their way into to the next generation. So you kind of, if I was a gene, what would I do in this kind of situation? And this is a good way then to kind of think about uh, evolutionary puzzles. Now, the gene here then is very much the kind of the gene of theoretical population gene genetics, where it isn't really defined clearly where one starts and one ends. George Williams, who wrote Adaptation Natural Selection in 1966, kind of the first clear articulation of the genes I view. Which, went, which was then followed by Dawkins in, in the selfish gene, both of them define a gene simply as that, that part of a chromosome that is not broken up by recombination and, and crossing over yeah, during um, meiosis in sexually reproducing organisms. So they kind of the part that's kind of inherited intact from one generation to, to the next. Uh, and they're both very clear that this kind of could be a kind of arbitrary length. It can be really short or it can be really quite long. So for example, as in the case of you know, the whole, by this definition then, the whole mitochondrial genome, because it's maternally inherited, it doesn't recombine most of the time, is, uh, could be thought of as one gene, or so kind of like part, the large part of the, the Y chromosome that never recombines with the X, it's kind of considered to be one gene. But then there are in parts where the recombination rate is really high, it's, it's shorter. And, and in many ways, the genes have been quite relaxed about this, because the point, point in that necessarily isn't exactly what the, the sequence is. And this has been then frustrating to uh, other corners of the field, particularly kind of molecular biology, biochemists, the, the ones who work so hard to work out exactly kind of the molecular details of it have been frustrated by this very fuzzy definition. Um, so this has kind of been one part of contention, perhaps early, especially early on, 
Um, I think now you can kind of recognize kind of depending what you want the gene concept to do in a way, you can kind of recognize that it won't exactly be the same because this kind of fuzziness of the genes I view, I think is very helpful when we are interested in kind of quite theoretical, quite abstract questions. We just want to think through when, when could a gene of these kind of properties spread in a population. But if you want to identify, you know, what is the genetic architecture of these traits, then that then you, you, it is really important because especially if you want to, like you want to be able to tell like is this you know this mutation here or this like maybe down to like you know the single nucleotide polymorphism single nucleotide level then of course you need to know where one gene starts and one ends and kind of what is the area that you're interested in and so on so i think kind of depending on what you wanted to do you can have you can have different definitions but particularly early on in the, in the debate people were less kind of pluralistic about it and were quite annoyed uh, with each other for using the same same word, but in different uh, ways. Yeah, well, one of the problems uh, with this view is the, the fact that we have a lot of, uh, and when I say a lot, it's a lot of junk DNA, especially when it comes to the higher eukaryotes, right? Um, so and and that makes this concept more fuzzy because um, I mean I mean of course I remember the way Dawkins was trying to define the, the 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 gene which is like any length of the DNA which just survives over many generations, right? Um, and if that DNA is uh, junk DNA, then what would be like the the point of that? Uh, you know, uh, so so how it will help. Uh, us in understanding. Yeah, so in, in, in a way, this kind of debates of um, junk DNA and the kind of other parts of, of the genome that, that clearly that has no kind of clear function for the organism. In a way, I, I always thought it's a good illustration of, of the power of the gene side view, because the kind of the, the way the gene side view approaches it then is that in a way, this is quite to be expected, because the, the, the purpose of then um, of, of, of genes of their own propagation, not necessarily to, to help the organism. Though those two interests often will align. I mean, most genes, most of the time, work together, and that's why we have organisms, and most traits are due to the kind of combined effort of, of multiple genes and so on. But you can kind of, the genes of you lends you to this idea quite easily that there are other ways of doing it. So if you can kind of just stick around for other reasons, then that will that may be favored by natural selection uh, as well, and then perhaps particularly because a lot of what what should be uh, qualifies as kind of junk DNA or like you know think like defunct transposable elements, so genes that had the ability to to promote their own uh, replication, but then they've lost it, and now they is kind of like there, and like you know the majority of um, transposon sequences in the human genome, which is chock full of transposons, right? they don't transpose, they, they've lost that ability. So they're just kind of sticking around. They're not really, they don't really come with much of a cost, but they also don't really contribute anything. So they're just kind of there. And that's kind of, the selection is not getting rid of it because the cost is not bad, but it's also not really doing anything. Yeah, and when we are talking about selection um, at the gene level, it's, it's basically this change in allelic frequency, right? It's not, so maybe we, we dive in a little bit uh, there, try to understand what is this allelic frequency and how it can change. Yeah, so this is the idea and that goes back to, 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 to the emergence of population genetics. Like when you, the recognition that the way traits are inherited is in these kind of discrete particle that we now call genes. And we, we recognize that for a specific gene, there may be multiple variants or we call alleles of that specific genes. And so we can kind of just understand evolution then by understanding why do certain variants or certain alleles become more common over time? So it's the kind of way of producing the kind of the whole complexity of what's going on in, in, uh, in biology or in evolution to this kind of, it's like, at the end of the day, the, the, these are these kind of inherited changes that's gonna kind of matter for evolution is the idea. And so you can kind of then describe evolution as if you have these, inherit these alleles ha will have this effect on, on fitness for the organism. And then over time, then the alleles that uh, improve fitness will, will spread uh, over, over time. And there are different ways of, of, of modeling this. Uh, you know, there, sometimes we talk about population genetic and the modern synthesis even more so as this kind of monolithic thing, but there were quite big disagreements among the kind of founders of population genetics. So like the way 
Ronald Fisher, for example, who I think is kind of, you can in many ways trace the ideas of the genes I've used back to. His approach to population genetics was much more genic in a way that like focused on single alleles compared to like someone like Sewell Wright, the one of the other um, main architects of population genetics, who was much more interested in kind of complex interactions between, between genes and how, and also in kind of non-selective explanations for why certain alleles become more common uh, or not. Um, and it, I think the genes I view has this very like focus on natural selection, on adaptation and on, kind of on, on, on talking about single genes. And I think this is a way of doing population genetics that can be traced back to, to Fisher much more so to, than to, to, to Sewell Wright. And there are, I think there are interesting ways in kind of, you can see um, modern disagreements of, of the genes I view as these kind of recent kind of reincarnations of disagreements between Fisher and, and Wright, that they kind of had this disagreement in the 1930s. And now we have kind of modern versions of similar kind of arguments, because like depending on how much em emphasis you want to put on, on different aspects of the system we're trying to, to understand. Yeah, and you use that word uh, fitness, right? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, so to quote, perhaps, to, to quote them, the third, uh, architect of, of population and J. J. Bass Holden, fitness is a bugger. It's, it's this like it's very central um, uh, property in, uh, in evolutionary biology, but it's also you know, really hard often to define more um, concretely or more formally. We all agree that it, it is some measure of, a, of an entity's ability to survive and, and reproduce. So kind of the reference kind of con usually, and usually we, we capture this in the kind of the genetic contribution to the next generation. Uh, but then, like, there are all these issues, and well, so is this a property of the individual? Is it a property of, of genes? Is it how do we measure it? Do we just count offspring? That's usually quite hard. What if the offspring die young? Do you count grand offspring? Often in, in natural population, that is uh, impossible to, to do it in a meaningful way. We try to measure proxies of it. Um, so you, you run into kind of interesting issues uh, at kind of all aspects uh, of the of the concept but usually it has to do, to do something with, with their kind of ability to contribute genetically to, to, to the next um, generation and then, then there are all these kind of nuances to it what you want your kind of fitness concept uh, to do uh, in a way. Yeah, and and so in general, the way um, I think the, the so the way um, this the stabilization of the evolution, which is basically uh, um, let's say if we have two alleles, um, one or the other allele would uh, stabilize in the frequency in the in certain population, right? Um, so 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 in terms of selection, I mean, if it is like I don't know about sixty percent. Uh, allele A or B, it can be this uh, simply eye color that, that we see, you know, most of us, we have brown color eyes, right? Um, so so how, how does it translate in, into that terms? I mean, the, the, the fitness or uh, different terms that we can define from the genes um, eye view. Yeah, so, so, that, so that, I mean, that, that you can assign then kind of you can either assign kind of fitness as being a property of, of the individual and then you think if you have this allele then the organism will have this kind of fitness so that like this will lead them to, to, to the to the to the organism surviving reproducing better and you can define fitness in that way you can also make kind of fitness as a property of, of the gene and calculate this kind of selection coefficient simply at each kind of uh, locus if, if, if you will um I mean, in all cases you know sometimes that will lead to certain alleles become you know come to fixation as we say so like everyone ends up with the same uh, mutation um a lot of times we will get this kind of polymorphism as you say eye color is a great example where that may or may not i, I don't know the story about eye color how much that has been is, is drift or, or selection but like it's maintained like it's, it's, it's clearly is a lot of variation and a lot of traits uh, are like that in humans and in most other kind of species a lot and uh, kind of an, I guess a, an empirical question is how much of that is due to natural selection maintaining this variation that certain traits is good in some environments but not in others and how much is this um, genetic drift which is kind of a you know a force we know that determines a lot of evolution at the uh, molecular level a lot of the, the genome in, in a lot of species is simply is evolving due to this kind of n n neutral or nearly neutral uh, evolutionary uh, modes. Um, 
Yeah, uh, let's go a bit more um, into the details of these issues. Uh, so first we can talk about simply the replicators and vehicles uh, part of the uh, genes view IF evolution. Yeah, so the genes, the, the, the kind of central claim of the genes I view is that the evolution by natural selection involves these two properties that play kind of complementary roles. So the first is that of uh, replicators. So, and these are defined as some entity who, whose information is kind of copied and transmitted in a, in a faithful way from, from one generation to the, to the next. And in uh, evolution, in, in kind of organic evolution, this, this role is typically filled by genes. These, so the, the, that's the, and why genes deserve this kind of special place in our explanation, because they are what is being uh, inherited, uh, the argument goes. Uh, there has been attempts to kind of generalize the replicated concept to include other forms uh, of other kinds of entities. So like memes were originally meant to fill a role for cultural um, evolution. Um, so this was introduced in the, in the last chapter of the, the first edition of the, of, the, of the selfish genes, be that kind of the cultural uh, replicator. Um, and I mean, that's a whole, there's a separate discussion. I think the word meme itself is a very successful meme, but you know, people who study cultural evolution um, full time, I think have, have settled on, on other ways of, of, of studying rather than the kind of replicator concept. But then the kind of in, in organic evolution, replicator is clearly not the whole story. They're complemented by then what Dawkins called um, vehicles. And they've sometimes also been known as interactors by, by um, by others who developed similar ideas, such as the philosophy with Hull. But the vehicle then is kind of where the replicators are housed, kind of the, the discrete bundles in where you, where you find the replicators kind of out there in, in, in natural populations. So this is typically uh, organisms would be a kind of canonical uh, vehicle. And the vehicles then is kind of both the, 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 the entity that kind of carries the, the replicators, but also that, that interacts with each other, interacts with, it, with the natural world. Um, so the organism is kind of the, the typical one. In principle, it could be like a cell, like in, in, in the kind of the examples of, of cancer, or indeed also like a, a group, right? So the kind of genes that you grew out very much of a kind of rejection of a certain kind of what is now known as naive group selection that was popular kind of in the mid um, 1900s. But it, in principle, the replicated vehicle distinction shows that the genes of view and certain kinds of group selection and multiple selection can be compa compatible with each other. And then you may, you may strongly prefer to not talk in terms of multiple levels or in terms of groups, but the replicated vehicle distinction is not the reason why, why that is. Um, but in general, that you should play these kind of two. Evolution management requires these two separate processes to, to talk about it. It's kind of the, the basic idea. And in many ways, one of the, the central claims of, of the genes I view. And what that does is that it changes the level of selection, right? Or where, where it's working. Yeah, so it, it, yeah, it's very much a, a, a way of approaching the, the levels of selection debate, which is goes back a long way about can evolution act on other levels than the kind of typical individual organism uh, level. And this is kind of a debate that has uh, especially arisen when we've been interested in social behaviors and because social behaviors that are harmful to the individual that carries, carries them out, but beneficial to someone else, such as like the worker sterility induced social insect, which is something that troubled Darwin as well. Like, you know, how can, how can this ever evolve by? How can this ever be an individual advantage? And then you have been ideas that, well, it's good for the group. So then they can still, uh, if natural selection is acting also acting at the group level, then this, um, these kind of traits can spread and that's certainly one way of, of formalizing it. Uh, the genes I view um, kind of grew out of this kind of um, inclusive fitness approach, which is an, an approach centered on, typically centered on the individual organism that the idea that you should, when you calculate fitness, going back to that question, like you shouldn't just thought, think about the, what, the direct fitness or the number of, of offspring that an individual has, but also you should add to that the other um, offspring that our, our focal individual is kind of causally responsible for. So if, if this focal individual kind of helps another individual have offspring, they, they should count for a focal individual too, but you should scale them then by relatedness. Um, similar then you have to like then subtract from our focal individual 
the, the offspring that someone else is causally responsible for. And, and this is like, you know, as you can tell, this could get quite messy quite quickly. And that, that partly kind of the, the why inclusive fitness can be complicated and mathematically uh, at times can be quite messy to, to get right. But the benefit is that you end up with this kind of fitness measure that is completely under the control of the individual organism. Um, and it highlights that costly trades can spread if an individual primarily helps uh, relatives to do so. Now, the genes that you grow out of this, you can kind of see that one way to think about it is, is, is from a genic perspective. So if, if I'm a gene, it doesn't necessarily matter if I'm transmitted through the organism in which I reside, or if a copy of me is transmitted through another individual. And that's kind of like the first time, as far as you can tell, that selfish genes was ever used uh, in print or it kind of written down was when Dawkins was prepare, preparing lecture notes when his advisor was away on sabbatical and he was going to lecture on, on Hamilton's ideas of inclusive fitness in the 1960s. So he kind of came up with this idea, way of uh, introducing the topic. So all of these ideas and kind of were kind of coexisting uh, and, and there's been this debate, you know, at what level is selection acting? Um, the replicated vehicle distinction in a way is a way to kind of reformulate the question because the, the, the genes that we would say that the gene is, the way that the gene is the, the ultimate unit of selection is in a different way than that we argue about whether it's the individual or the group. In that regardless of whether, where kind of selection is acting, the gene is always the ultimate beneficiary of natural selection. Because regardless of how selection is operating ecologically, it's always the gene that's the only thing that is being uh, transmitted. It's the only thing that kind of survives across generation. And that's why we should think about the evolution kind of in terms of that it benefits um, the gene. And this, is, this kind of, again, goes back to the distinction between replicators and vehicles in the sense that replicators are um, what is the most important because organisms are these kind of temporary occurrences, this unique combination of genotype and environment and their interaction. Here in one generation, and then they're gone. They're like they, that, that kind of exact unique combination that will never exist again. Whereas the gene kind of just marches down the generation. So then like the genes have you kind of want to get rid of kind of like, you can argue about individuals and groups or self, what have you, but that's kind of like a separate question. Gene is the only thing that is transmitted. And that's, and that's why the argument goes, genes deserve this special role in our, in our explanations. Yeah, and of course, uh, from that, it also deserves that selfishness. Um, but then, um, of course, the, we, we sort of come out of that view uh, when we try to explain altruism. And I think one of the, the, the good example is skin selection. Um, so that we can talk about and see that how from genes I view, we can understand something like skin selection. Yeah, so skin selection was a term um, given by um, John Maynard Smith to, to describe uh, Hamilton's idea. Hamilton had coined this term inclusive fitness to describe this property of, of the individual, but it was recognized then that like the way Hamilton's ideas often work is that it involves interaction between relatives, between kin, and it kind of you can kind of describe it as kind of selection among relatives as kin selection, and that's why you kind of get this kind of genic view that well I'm I'm here but like a copy of me is in 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 my brothers, so you know whether the individual I'm in has an offspring or the brother it matters less from, from a gene side view. So it comes, comes quite naturally to kind of approach it um, in, that, uh, in, the, in that way. Um, yeah. And also like, oh, the other thing about like the selfishness and it's kind of highlights, so the, the selfish interest then becomes for every gene that to make it into the next generation. And that from, from the selfish interest of the gene, it doesn't really matter again, through which route you do it as the same kind of selfish interest uh, gets served. It I mean, and this perhaps then you, you kind of you run into like, you know, you said gene is, is, is a strange term because it's defined in a in somewhat unusual way. So is selfishness, right? Because like here you kind of define all genes to be selfish, uh, which when, when, when it includes all genes, it's not always as, as, as helpful, but also kind of like you run it, like that kind of selfishness is quite, is different from selfishness at the individual level. So it's like kind of like, shift in what we mean by the term, uh, which again is kind of slightly different when we talk about um, self, like, you know, what I've studied a lot of selfish genetic elements, which in some ways kind of, then we use selfishness in a narrower sense than in the kind of selfish, in that all genes are, are, are selfish, um, 
just as kind of another example of how the kind of the semantics of this is uh, not just mere semantics. It's also quite it, it matters quite a lot here what, what what we mean by the terms and sometimes how we use the language can contribute to the to the confusions that arise. Yeah, and and on yeah, I mean on one hand this has caused a lot of harm um, of understanding the concept. I mean it's a beautiful concept, but just probably you know using that selfish word kind of uh, has uh, changed the meaning that that comes out of it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, it's an, you know, you can debate for a while, for a long time, you know, was it good to call it the selfish gene or not? Dawkins has, you know, at times, you know, said or joked about it, you could, it might as well have been called the, the cooperative gene and the message, you won't have to change the book sometimes, or, you know, would you call it the, the immortal gene? Uh, in some ways, like the immortal gene would have been a better title, I think, in a sense, like that is in some ways, like the really key message of it is that, why genes are special is because in this way of thinking they are kind of immortal and that's like is that property of them that they are what's being transmitted or that's what kind of form these lineages across generation across evolutionary time and that's what sets them apart from organisms and groups and and so on that in a way is kind of like i think the the the, the core message uh, but then i mean it's also subgene is, is brilliant right like we're still talking about it people, people are still you know are arguing about it and that probably wouldn't have been the case uh, uh if it had another title so yeah um so so one thing that we left out of the uh, the these you know from the semantics is the adaptation so uh what is the adaptation and um how we can understand it from gene's eye view yeah, so adaptation is, is, is very much part of the origin story of the gene side view. So adaptation is kind of um, the fact that organisms seem to be almost as if designed to fit so well into their environment. That kind of to explain adaptation, to explain why organisms have that property, have that kind of fit to the environment. Um, that is in many ways to the gene side view, the central question that the theory of evolution should try to explain how can that come about um so it is very much part of that kind of tradition of evolution about that, that sees that as the central problem and that's why you can kind of trace it back almost so in book i talk about the kind of this um legacy of of william paley who was this english natural theologian who you know, wrote this book in um early 19th century about like all these kind of different examples of how um especially animals are kind of so well designed and he used it as an argument for for the existence of a creator but you can kind of like you can almost take that book and just take out the references to a creator and insert talk about natural selection and you get kind of the genes have used approach to the world and that's so and dawkins uh, and, and others have used paley a lot as a kind of rhetorical um tool i mean Dawkins clearly does not share the, the metaphysics of, of Paley, but I mean, he wrote a whole book called The Blind Watchmaker, which is a, in reference to the watchmaker analogy that Paley uh, popularized. Uh, so adaptation has a central role in, in, in the story of, of, of the gene side view. Um, and the, again, it kind of comes back to that the question of kind of where adaptations are, the, are they the good for the, the organism, good for the group? In some ways, it's slightly different from how the genes I view want to talk about. It. And to them, it's all at the end of the day good for the for the gene. The genes are the ultimate beneficiaries. So, like when you think about uh, trait, like an adaptive trait, like you know the um, the white fur of the of the polar bear, or you know the those orchids that look kind of like uh, a female bee. So male bees will come there to try to to mate with them, but actually end up pollinating the plant. All of those traits, you think of I mean, like that they're for the good of the, the genes that are under life. That's what allows them to, to propagate and spread into the next generation. It's kind of, again, taking kind of a familiar observation, uh, like adaptation, and then like repurposing it into like a specific way of asking questions about them, which the genes have you ultimately. It's a way of thinking about plants and animals and other organisms and why, why they are the way they are. And that's like, that they should take, they should approach that from, from the genic perspective rather than, than any other. Yeah, and, and basically that's the introduction of this extended phenotype. Uh, 
Um, and here we can also talk uh, or bring another debate into the discussion, which is this nature nurture debate, you know. So how environment affects um, our genetics or genotype to phenotype kind of thing. Um, so what, what do we understand here from Gene's eye view? I mean, the Gene's eye view has very much been caught, uh, for at least for a time, we're kind of caught up uh, in, in debates about how, how much of a trait is due to um, genetic vari variation, how much is due to environment, and how much is uh, due to, to their uh, interaction. Um, particularly because the genes I view has a certain way of talking about it that like it uses language in a rather like casual way, or sometimes I mean, people, uh, critics would say a, a sloppy way. You talk about, you often hear this, like, you know, what imagine a gene for X, where an X can be you know, something really quite complex, like a behavior or some complex phenotypic trait. And that, you know, if you're really careful about like wanting to understand this kind of question, um, like what is the genetic architecture of this trait, it's not very helpful because <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of sloppy. I, I mean, I would say that the genes have you clearly put genes at the center of it, um, but, it, but it, it also is not in no way kind of incompatible that a lot of time environment plays a big role or that genes has the environmental uh, effects. So I think it's quite clear why you get caught up in it, but I think you can kind of caught up in that debate and continue to, to be there. But my impression is also that like, the genes have never really been too interested in that debate. And that like, that's in some ways just kind of, that the genes have wants to think, understand kind of the logic of, of natural um, selection. And it's kind of less interested in this kind of like careful empirical study of the genetics of traits. It would I mean, kind of whole fields of quantitative genetics and now kind of you know uh, population compared to genomics that does exactly that. And I think the genes view has been less interested in that simply. It's kind of I think it's related to it, and I think it's kind of like, it's kind of clear that the, the two have been related. But um, to to me, it always seemed like a little bit of a of a orthogonal issue to to the issues that the, the genes of view are are truly kind of interested uh, in. What is the environment in the genes I view? Yeah, it's a, it's a fun question. Uh, I think the genes I view has a much more, I, I, I've described as kind of an expanded notion of, of the genes I view, of, of, the, of the environment. Uh, and very much is one that goes back to, to Fisher, who kind of introduced uh, this, that for the genes I view, takes really seriously. Like if we put ourselves in the shoes of, of a gene, or more specifically of, of an allele, so if you imagine that you're an allele and you look around, what, what is around you? Well, what is around you is that, imagine if you're in a diploid organism like humans, so we have two copies of each thing. If you're an allele, well, the other allele at the same locus is kind of out there. So is the rest of the, the genome. It's kind of also kind of something that your effect as an allele is going to be in the context of. And then of course you have the kind of what we kind of the conventional environment, you know, temperature, pH of the soil, precipitation, predators and prey uh, that are around you. Um, what we can typically mean by it. But from a gene side view then, you also have to account for like th that the rest of the genome, as well as kind of all the other uh, genes that are, are segregating in the, in the gene pool out there, that that is also part of the environment. And this is why you can kind of make this, build this case for why Fisher is the kind of, in some ways the grandfather of the gene side view. He didn't use, the kind of language of the genes I view. You didn't have this kind of like agential thinking that we now associate with, with the genes I view, but a lot of these kind of ideas of that, what the environment is and that you can kind of think in terms of kind of the average effect of, of alleles in different kinds of contexts, you can trace back to, to Fisher. And I think that's in some ways is really one of the more kind of radical notions of, of the genes I view that you take, again, a common term, environment we have a kind of a intuitive sense of what that means but in the genes have you, you you adjust it slightly in the same way as we do about gene and selfishness and and and, and, uh, and now also uh, environment so, so if we uh, let's say um, you know think of genes i view in the uh, kind of um, darwin's theory of evolution or uh, you know uh, mendelian genetics coming together it's kind of this modern synthesis can there be a modern synthesis of uh, genes i view in 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 a way where we start defining the gene at the molecular level and see if that can work out <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of time, I think kind of, though there are different ways of defining genes, a lot of time, I think they can, um, they become the same thing. They're kind of boiled down to the same thing. So when we, when people do these kind of like coalescence analysis or thinking of like this specific mutation and then they go back in time and kind of trace it, how it has spread uh, across uh, the polygenetic tree going back in time and see so kind of to the individual where it first, this mutation first arose. Then they kind of, the abstract notion of the genes that we kind of really kind of boils down to kind of quite concrete thing. So a lot of time I think you can combine it with what we learn about um, genes from kind of uh, from genomics that there isn't really a, a much of a kind of conflict uh, there about what, what a gene is. And indeed, I think they're often, uh, you, you may have debate, you know, should you count, is this the, the, the specific nucleotide change or is the whole region as you count? And I mean, th those, are, those issues arise also in, in genomics, regardless of what you think of, of the gene side. View. So I mean, in, in many ways, I think that has um, goes goes well with with the genes of you, and especially you kind of think of that the, the genome of a specific organism is this mosaic of things that they have inherited from different um, ancestors that have combined uh, at each time, each mating uh, in, in a sexually reproducing uh, organism. So there, I think it, it it works really well. It's kind of technological improvement that the genes of you predate it. But so there's population genetics, right? The, the, the kind of theoretical models that are at the heart of a lot of analysis that we do in, in population comparative genomics go back to uh, a time before we knew that DNA was what provided the, the uh, material basis for heredity. And in some ways, they, these models, of course, have been updated in light of what we learn about the, the, these material properties, but the, the kind of core of the models hold up and uh, still, which is, I think is, is, is uh, says something interesting about it, about uh, more generally perhaps in, in kind of in science and in biology about what level of abstraction can be helpful that sometimes is really important to get the, the specific details, empirical details of a system right. Sometimes, you know, you can, you can still kind of zoom out and talk about a system in a more abstract way and you can still learn really interesting things because then you, you start thinking about in terms of other kinds of properties of the system, that the abstractness of population genetics allows to focus on things like, you know, selection coefficients and population size, mutation rate, recombination rate, these kind of things that you can measure all these things in the kind of impressive uh, precision, but sometimes it also helps you to talk about it in a more abstract way. And I think the interplay between that is, 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 is really uh, interesting. And I think we kind of move into a phase where you can kind of do that uh, in, in a really kind of productive way. Yeah, uh, let's take uh, genes I view to uh, kind of your work, but also include the the other term which we call green beards. Uh, so green beards and uh, selfish genetic elements. Yeah, so th th these are both kind of examples of where I think the genes I view has really come into its own. So a lot of my own research has focused on genetic conflicts, so where genes in that are located inside of the same organism have different fitness interests, if you will, kind of what's good for one gene is, is, is not good for the other. And th this is, there are so many ways that these kind of conflicts can arise. We talked about transposable elements, these mobile genetic elements that can make copies of themselves and move, move around in the genome, something that increases their uh, copy number or their abundance in, in the genome, but also sometimes they, they, they cause, they're kind of great source of mutation, sometimes of minor effects, sometimes of, of large, uh, you have genes that can interfere of interfering the process of meiosis. So when normally we think of Mendelian inheritance that you have a specific allele that's fifty percent chance of making it to into the into the offspring. It's kind of the, the, what, why Mendelian inheritance is known as fair meiosis is known as fair. But you have these kind of meiotic drivers and segregation distortions that end up in ninety ninety five percent of all the the offspring rather than the fifty percent that. Mendelian inheritance should uh, tell they should. Um, one, one, I think one of the really cool examples that we hear a lot about now because of uh, how CRISPR and the idea of the gene drives that you can you kind of introduce genes with certain properties into a population because they are inherited more than um, that kind of beyond Mendelian rules that are built on the kind of natural system known as homing endonucleases that when when you're present in a heterozygous state the 
the homogeneous nucleus can damage the other uh, allele and then use itself as a template to repair that site. And all of a sudden now it's a homozygous. So it guarantees its own transmission. And this is, you can kind of mimic or build, engineer these systems using CRISPR-Cas9. That's why when you read about gene drives and the kind of role that they may play in kind of eradicating uh, malaria vectors and so on, this is kind of the natural system that they, they may make. Uh, you also have conflicts that may arise simply because not all genes are inherited in the same way. So for example, one, a good example is that one between the maternally inherited mitochondrial genome and the, the, the nuclear genome where you have half of it come from uh, the father and half of it come from the mother and how uh, those genes in those two different genomes may come into conflict of specifically over uh, allocation, like what sex, like allocation into females and into males, which is specifically um, an issue in, in uh, hermaphrodites. So this kind of conflict is very well studied in hermaphroditic plants. So should you, should you invest in pollen, male, male reproduction, or into obvious female reproduction? And there's, there's a really fascinating dynamic there. So, that, that, that's, so in a way, to me, to me, that's kind of what's the, the, the real kind of like point where my fascination for uh, the, the kind of bigger conceptual issues of the genes have you, but also kind of this desire to wanting to study something real, to do kind of empirical work in, in biology. To me, that's like a perfect mix to study a genetic conflict because you get kind of the, the best of both worlds in many ways. Uh, green beds are, are kind of related. Um, they can sometimes be source of, of genetic conflicts, although most of the time it seems like they, they are not. Uh, but this is an idea that also go back to, to Bill Hamilton and Hamilton's ideas of inclusive fitness and, and what, what later became known as uh, kin selection. Um, and it was Hamilton who introduced the, the thought experiment, but then the term green bed uh, itself comes from um, Dawkins, who often was a very, you know, extremely good at making Hamilton's ideas more uh, penetrable. And the thought experiment is, is this. So imagine uh, a gene or a set of tightly linked genes that do um, three things. First, it gives the, the individual that has the gene a, a green beard. Uh, it gives the, the individual also the ability to recognize other individuals that have a green beard and instead them to behave nepotistically or altruistically towards those uh, individuals. Um, and the point here then is like, is that in this situation, you can imagine that like two individuals are have the same green beard genes, even though they're not related otherwise, but they're kind of, they're hundred percent related at these two sites. Uh, at, at, the, at the green bed gene locus. Uh, and it shows them that the same kind of ideas of kin selection and, and, and inclusive fitness can work here, that what really matters is not the genome-wide relatedness, um, which is kind of the basic idea of, of kin selection, but in, actually what matters is the relatedness at the, the gene or genes that are involved in the social behavior. So it's kind of a thought experiment to demonstrate that point, that kin selection is typically how Hamilton's ideas is gonna play out, but it doesn't have to. It's like the, the idea is broader than that, if you will. So, and because this like thought experiment seem quite fanciful, like how on earth can you get a gene that do all these things? So people typically thought that, yes, it's fun. It's like, you know, cute thought experiments. It brings the point home, but it's more like a teaching device than anything. We now know that there are a couple of examples of, of, of green bit, particularly in, in um, microbial species. So one of my favorite examples come from, from yeast. Um, that, so yeast uh, can, when uh, exposed to stress, they form these uh, clumps that they kind of come together in these, then technically known as flocks, but it kind of looks like clumps or chunks of, of cells. Uh, and it is simple that like the, 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 the cells at the center of, of the clump are protected from whatever this kind of stress is outside, whereas like the kind of one surrounding it is, uh, kind of sacrificing themselves for that. And kind of a typical stressor is, is alcohol, which is why uh, beer brewers knew of this behavior quite early on. Um, but now when people have studied the genetics of it, it turns out that the, 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 a key, the key gene that is involved in this kind of flocking or clumping behavior behaves as uh, a green bead uh, locus. Uh, so you can kind of, depending on, if you mix different strains of yeast, the ones that will end up clumping together are the ones that share the same, um, that have the same copy of, of that specific gene, if, even if they may be um, 
quite different uh, otherwise, like, like the genome wide average may be quite uh, different. And uh, so there are examples of this and most of them seem to come from uh, uh, microbial species. So there are examples also in um, uh, ants, for example. Yeah, I mean, of course the yeast uh, would do it no matter which type of yeast is there. I mean, for any yeast, uh, of course, the when it comes to the real behavior or basically uh, neural system dependent behavior, uh, which uh, of course happens in humans, we do it uh, to another extent, extent. And I think that also becomes the reason of uh, tribalism and you know this kind of behavior where we, of course, we kind of look to the kins or the, the people who have the similar thinking. Um, but then yeah. we also kind of discriminate between the, 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 the people with the other kind of thinking, right? I mean, I mean in some ways, that's what's so nice about studying behavior in like yeast or other sort of, that you can kind of, you can control for, you can do, if you're interested in, in the, the, again, coming back, if you're interested in the genetics of traits, that's kind of what you want to use, work on because you can control, you can control the environment, you can control, um, the genetics of, of the individual interacting, which it's you know impossible in, in humans. And humans are fascinating for all sorts of reasons, right? We do all this like really fascinating behaviors and, and, and other things, but like you can't do the kinds of experiments that we can on 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 other organisms, uh, which I think is like why at the end of the day, why so many of us work on you know, yeast or fruit flies or, or or plants, where you can kind of you can if you're interested in the kind of the mechanism of traits or behavior, that's kind of what you want to work on because you can uh, do the proper controls and kind of get at it in, 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 a, uh, in a proper way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what are the major issues with the genes I, I of you? I mean, of course, we have discussed over the discussion, but just to like summarize it in a, in a way. Yeah. So I think the, the main criticism is that the genes have paints a too simplistic view of biology, that the, the emphasis on genes or on replicators, while helpful for certain kinds of questions, particularly things like genetic conflicts, uh, it also leaves out too much. In particular, like that at the end of the day, it's organisms who are out there and, and, and doing things. And that's at the level where we should talk about it. It also kind of uh, tends to downplay complex interactions between genes and, and people who are interested in uh, the development of traits, like how do you go from a fertilized embryo into a full organism, and how how does that developmental process interact with with selection and evolution? Think that if you do too much focus on on genes, leave out to uh, all these other aspects of it, and in particular when the traits or what we're interested in involves the interaction of, of so many genes, each with a tiny little effect, that it makes no sense to talk about a gene wanting to do anything because that's not really how the system works it's it's much more uh complex uh than that um so i think there there are i think kind of interesting interesting um and good uh criticisms and that like i think that's where where those details begin to matter exactly like complex genetic interactions parts of development or in system where you know what's transmitted from parent offspring is more than just genes i mean i think genes still Deserves a special role because that has it has its stability and persistence and um, but in, in an organism where you kind of have um, kind of forms of cultural inheritance and so on that that's on top of it too much focus on genes I think may, may make you lose sight of that um, so to me I think like so if there's so I think that the genes are really still is it's a tremendously powerful way to think about evolution uh, but the way I like to put it is that like it, it is a is a tool it's a thinking tool. Uh, but, but like like all tools, you need to understand what it was designed to do. That like it is a way to wanting to think about uh, adaptation and to, trying to understand that, and particularly kind of those that don't really make sense from the perspective of the individual organism. That's what so examples of social behaviors or genetic conflicts. That, that's when it really comes into to its own. But there are other questions like if you want to if you're interested in how developments shape evolution, it, it, it will lose some of its power i think um and that's why i think i, I also like the idea of calling it a tool because you know in the same way as a say it's a, it's, a, it's a hammer or a knife a better tool well it depends what you want to do in the same way like it's, it's calculus or geometry a better so well again <laughs> it depends on what you want to do and what we're trying to understand so i think and if you kind of keep that in mind i think the genes have you uh 
with its limitations, still has a really important role to to play in uh, in biology uh, today. Well, that's a great take home message. Um, so, but then what does understanding evolution mean? So are, are we going to uh, go on like getting or developing these, these kind of more tools or um, maybe one day we can reach uh, at a point where we can have a kind of this grand theory or grand unified theory of um, evolution. Well, so what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways we have Evolution has this grand unifying theory, and that that is evolution by natural selection. So these kind of debates are more, I think, ways to like how to frame that. Like that, the same, the kind of foundation remains the same. And here, I kind of think we're dealing about more about nuances, uh, how to to think about it and how to kind of approach it. So um, in that way, I think we already have that grand unifying theory, uh, and these are kind of versions of it. Uh, it is an interesting question about like how much time we should think about kind of like trying to reconcile different ways of um, doing evolutionary biology that I think in, in many ways, I think it's good that we have different perspectives and different approaches because like while, you know, not all perspectives are created equal, but most can contribute uh, something. So that's why, I mean, I think I have a lot of, you know, I do think that the genes have view is extremely helpful. I have a lot of sympathy for, you know, inclusive fitness theory and so on. But also, I mean, but also, I mean, I think that ideas that have also been viewed as being conflict for kind of opposing that, so like, you know, multi-level selection or uh, Evo Devo evolution developmental biology, you know, clearly also has things to to contribute. And so, to, so in a way, I think it would be good to move away from this kind of either or situation where each side is kind of calling the other, you know, simplistic or you know, missing the point and that kind of thing. I think that is uh, not the way we do things. Uh, I do think that, so sometimes, uh, most of the time, I, I think like that, that like we should just kind of maintain this plurality of, of, of uh, perspectives. At the same time, I think there are interesting situations where the way we do things are so different that we sh maybe, should we be a little worried? That like, so, or, I don't know if worried is the right word, but maybe it would be interesting to think about how they fit together. Take, take population genetics, right? so one of the, 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 the foundations, the backbone of evolutionary biology, one of the most successful branches of, of biology. They established in, you know, 1960s that like optimization, natural selection never really optimizes anything. Things are may come into equilibrium, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's op the system is being optimized. Um, and that, that is well established. You move over to behavioral ecology instead of animal behavior, who, you know, just like economists do, use optimization models all the time. And they're also really successful. You know, the, the, you know, in understand that there is really helpful in trying to understand uh, animal behavior, and so they, on some level, are clearly are like they are, of course, compatible in some way. They're describing the same system, but they're also very using very their assumptions about what's going on are really quite different, and they're not that many people who try to move in between. There are examples of it, and I think those are really uh, fascinating. But most of the time, I think we biologists are rather pragmatic that we don't worry too much about these things. You just want to get on trying to understand your system and like these kind of, these kind of concerns are, um, I think tend to excite philosophers more, which I, which I always like, why well, I always like hanging out with philosophers too, because they, they care about these um, kind of things more than, than my biology um, colleagues uh, do. So as you can hear, I'm, I'm a bit of two minds of this. I haven't really made up either. So, but uh, yeah. The so, what do you think about falsifiability in in biology? You know, because that's the uh, this is where the I mean, of course, the falsifiability can make things more cl clear, but then probably that's uh, that's the problem with the with the biology so far that we are not probably thinking about making things clear and uh, just continuing with the with the arguments which suits our system. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think falsifiability clearly plays a role. I think sometimes people have a naive view of what that means. Clearly it's like most uh, working scientists, you know, don't abandon everything as soon as like one experiment contradicts the, their theory, they clearly have a more nuanced view of it. Uh, and I think certain questions or disagreements in, in, in biology can be solved by the, you set up, you know, neat experiments and, and, and tests that you can falsify one hypothesis over the other. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, there's lots of that kind of work going on. 
like the dean side views, the debate over the dean side view is not one that you know lends itself to that because it's, it's a it's a it's about a way of thinking, a, a way of like conceptualizing evolution in, at an abstract level. So it's not kind of a straightforward empirical hypothesis um, that can be falsified or verified. Though it can certainly can help us come up with such for specific systems. Similarly, like you know, it's not a mathematical general mathematical framework, though it can certainly help us come up with more specific models or formalized parts of certain ideas that we get uh, from it. So, that's it. so I think like you know, biology, like all sciences, has these certain disagreements that can be settled. You know, we figured out that DNA was a double helix, and then you know we moved on. And then you know, for certain kinds of questions, it's it's that quite cut and dry. Um, but other aspects, and particularly these that are more kind of like philosophical in nature, they are not like they, they, they not they don't get settled in that way. And the kind of reason why they, you know, so I think, depending on the kind of problem, that kind of falsifiability approaches will play different uh, roles uh, ultimately. I think. Yeah, I think the this DNA um, double helix is a great example because, of course, that debate also went on for long long time. It's just that. We had the right experiment. We we got this crystal structure, and we knew that okay, it's uh, we we got the model of the uh, helix, and it was clear that okay, now we can settle on this and uh, go to the next right. Part. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But like then, but then, and I think that is part of biology is like that, and yeah. part of biology is not like that. And then like you have to settle agree disagreement in in other ways, and and also that's why certain debate tend to to linger on in a much greater greater way. Okay, and what else do you recommend to read uh, to the audience? Um, oh, so, so much. I mean, I think um, go, go back and read. Um, I think the extended phenotype is the most exciting introduction to uh, to the dean's eye view, I think. Uh, I should also say that this has been kind of in modern times, I think there's been so much great philosophy of biology that has really contributed to our understanding. So books like Samir Okasha's The Evolutions and the Levels of Selection. Uh, it's a philosophy book, but like probably was the book that had the most influence on me as a graduate student in biology. I thought like it's, it really helped me uh, shape my uh, my thinking. Um, uh, you know, the, the book on uh, genetic uh, conflicts by Austin Burt and Robert Trivers called These in Conflict about the, the biology of um, of these issues, um, yeah. This the um, yeah. Go back and read the uh, go, re read all papers, read all books. I think. I mean, I'm, very, I'm a very strong believer in that. Um, biologists should know their their own history, and especially because uh, we that's for exactly the reason that we deal with issues that can sometimes be settled by uh, simple experiments or simple you know developing new mathematical models. But we also deal with a lot of issues. That cannot, and so I think the only way to to really uh, understand this is by uh, knowing that history. So, for example, now, I mean, I think so. Ulrika Segerstrol has, has written; she's a, has written about you know she wrote a biography of Bill Hamilton. She wrote this book, book about the sociobiology debate. So, both you know, well worth reading, and also kind of worth putting in the context where she came from and kind of who she was close with when she wrote this book. And yeah, there's so, so much kind of fascinating history about evolutionary biology. Um, and it's no shortage. All right. Uh, with that, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and uh, presenting the world uh, with with the history of uh, Gene's eye view of evolution. It's a great book. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. <laughs>